Hi, everyone. Uh, we are just about to start our uh, webinar, uh, and we're going to, we've got some participants that are uh, joining Hi. us here. Yep, thank you. We've got everybody joining us. Well, I'd like to say uh, welcome to everybody. Um, Sandra, thanks for the invitation to host. So uh, this, this seminar is titled Insider Tips for Buying Your First Home. And um, my name is Chris Bisson. I used to be a mortgage broker. And uh, today I run a company called Value Connect that specializes in appraisals. And I'd like to introduce Sandra to you, for those of you that don't know her. Sandra is one of Canada's top producing mortgage agents. She's in the top 1% of all mortgage brokers in the country. And she's the, in the top three producing mortgage center franchise owners in Ontario. She's completed- So, so what, does that, what, does, <laughs> what does that mean, Chris? <laughs> well, it means that you know what you're talking about. Uh, you've got <laughs> thousands of mortgages, you've helped thousands of clients uh, coast to coast. And it's just a, it's a privilege to be here with you. So, uh, Standy, uh, the real estate market has been red hot over the last couple of years. And yeah. um, we've seen prices rising quickly in both urban and rural markets. What are you telling your buyers these days? Yeah, it's, re it's really challenging, especially if you're going to be buying your first house. And today we have parents joining us. Uh, we have first-time home buyers joining us, and we also have some real realtors joining us who are helping first-time home buyers. So what I'm telling them is increase your budget on what you're buying and lower your expectations. And what I mean about that is even a couple of years ago, because we have sometimes it takes people a year or a year and a half to find a property. Um, and in just that year or year and a half, or I'm working with some clients who have been pre-approved two years ago. And, you know, they've, they've sort of changed their tune about being picky about the type of property that they're going to be buying, right? So maybe a, two years ago, you could buy a detached house in, in Guelph and maybe 25 kilometers out for like 600 or 750 now, you know, the average price of a house in this area is, is close to a million. So I'm, I'm telling buyers to increase your budget and lower your expectations and, you know, and, and think about this more as a, as a stepping stone um, to get into something that you really wanted to get into. Right. Um, now, for rural and smaller towns. Um, yeah. Like, and uh, let me maybe there... touch... I was just going to Go say a lot, a lot of people have, have bought homes hours away from the city or from where they used to work if they had to go into work. Um, now, there's a lot of talk about maybe things have changed for good. Are there any considerations for that? I guess home buyers need to think about in terms of maybe they get called back or that they have to go back to an office setting? Yeah, so that's a great a question because we're finding that, you know, like we are actually servicing people pretty much from Guelph to Windsor. Like we have not met a client physically in our office since February 2020. And we've done, a, I think we've done a really great job at, you know, helping clients like transition. And I mean, for, for those of you who are first time home buyers, <laughs> you're like, I, I, they feel it's icky to go into a bank and sit in a, 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 like a small, yeah, that's gross. But for those of you who are uh, parents who are uh, thinking about co-signing, you maybe can't imagine anything different. So what we're finding is we're actually helping people who may have thought originally they were going to buy in Guelph, Kitchener, Waterloo, Fergus, now buying in Woodstock or now buying in London. You know, or like we also are having seen more and more people buy into Arthur, like Arthur in this area. So, so what I'm saying is that your, to answer your question, one of the other insider tips when you're doing your first mortgage with this idea of 
this is a property that you're only going to be living in maybe for a couple of years, is you want to really be careful about the kind of mortgage that you get because there's a lot of misinformation out there online. You know, you've got all sorts of interest rates out there. You don't know to what heads and tails are. And so that's why you want to work with a professional who can read the fine print for you. And you want to make sure that that port uh, mortgage is portable. Mm -hmm. So you're not going to pay a huge penalty. And you can take that mortgage to the next house. And then you also want to make sure that... Um, that sometimes the deeply discounted mortgages have huge penalties to pay. So it's like a bait and switch tactic. Oh yeah, you get this lower rate, but it, you, have, you have a high penalty to discharge it in two years if you've got to move back. So that kind of feeds into your question, Chris. What we're starting to see is a lot of uh, employers are going towards a hybrid model. So they're not going to be asking their uh, employees to be at work full in the office, but they may ask for, you know, one or two days a week, maybe one or two days a month. So people who are buying in London, for example, and working in Guelph may only be commuting uh, one or two days a month. But let's just say if your employer says, no, you've got to come in four days a week That's into the office. Twice, even twice a week, that'd be a lot. Yeah, so you might reconsider then what used to be a good deal in London, now you're moving, and so you want to make sure that you can take that mortgage with you. So that's a really great insider tip. Okay. Um, Pre-qualification versus pre-approval. What, what's the difference and when should you get those in place? Yeah, so before I used to kind of be a little weary about pre-qualification um, because pre-qualification you just dump a couple of numbers into a calculator and out spits a number but I'm actually encouraging people to do that and if I can just uh, put this in my chat so if you guys go to my website and I'll, I'll do a nice follow-up email uh, to all of you so in my chat you've got my website there skipthebank.ca you can actually go there and download a pre-qualification calculator. It's quick and easy. It kind of gives you an idea of um, what you can um, get approved, pre-approved for. And the reason why I'm encouraging people to, to do that, and as I said, our calculator is probably the best, one of the best out there in Canada. It's won awards. It gives you a really good idea of what you can qualify for. Um, and then you know whether or not you need a cosigner or whether or not you can, uh, whether or not you need um, to have your family members help you with a down payment. So to go back to answer your question, pre-qualification, you can download our app, get a really great estimate on what you can qualify for, and then you'll want to be in touch with us and we'll actually take you through the pre-approval process. So we'll do a credit check. We'll confirm income. Income documentation is really great, uh, important up front. I'm actually working with uh, first-time home buyers that went to their bank, and TD had actually declined them because he just started a new job, um, and she's on maternity leave. Yeah, and they're not going back. She's not going back to work until September. But because she has been in her job for at least three years. Um, we could use her back to work income and the, her hus her partner, um, although he just started a new job and it was on a probationary period, he has worked in the same industry for four years. So it was really great because they did the pre-qualification. They thought, oh, you know, I can do this. Um, then they... Um, then they did the pre-approval with their bank. <laughs> the bank declined them and they said, you know what, maybe we need to go back to the mortgage center. So, so the difference between a pre-approval and a pre-qualification is, is quite different. The pre-qualification will give you just an idea of your budget, whether or not you're going to need a co-signer. And we deal with, work with co-signers all the time. And then the pre-approval, you go through the process of doing the credit check and also income qualification. Okay, so Sandy, there's a couple of um, questions in the and comments in the chat. So I just want to let everybody know that uh, we will do our best to answer those as appropriate during the uh, the webinar here. 
So um, Cindy sent a note just saying uh, that her um, son qualifies for X amount of money. And if she were to co-sign, how could things possibly change? I assume that as long as their debt payments, like uh, Cindy's debt payments are low compared to her income, that it should improve or increase the amount that they would be approved for. Well, I, I, I'd like to jump in here because, uh, you know, that this is very interesting because I work with parents all the time. And um, what, what people my age and older <laughs> need to get over is it's financial institutions are not looking at net worth anymore, Chris, right? Yeah. They are looking to debt, debt to income ratio. So if the co-signer, let's just say, has a mortgage and they have a $500,000 or $500 car payment, you know, and, and they're making a hundred grand, they, if they carry a lot of debt, bringing them into the uh, mix as a co-signer might actually um, hurt the, the clients. And that's a very difficult conversation. So for those of you who are parents, you know, don't be put off because, uh, you know, you think, oh, gee, I have a lot of net worth. If you're helping your, um, uh, if you're helping your children and they have 20% down or more, you know, they can probably qualify for an alternative loan, even if you are carrying some debt. Okay. Thank you, Sandy. Um, and then uh, there was another question about the average age for a first time home buyer. I think what we'll do with that is uh, just for anybody that attends, we'll try to dig up the most recent CMHC first time home buyer report that came out in the last 10 months. And we can, uh, we can send that out to the attendees. All right. Yeah, that's perfect. Okay. Um, I, I can t I can tell you anecdotally, though, like, I think, you know, some uh, research just a couple of years ago said the average age of home ownership was about 33 years, right? Is that for and first time, first time home buyer? Okay. First time home buyers, yeah. And I'm suspecting that has gone up, right? Just because of uh, income issues and also, you know, having to save more money for a down payment. That's anecdotal evidence, but uh, I, I, I can find that information out. I, I just saw a really a good report that I didn't have a chance to read a couple of days ago. And then just uh, for all of the people here, uh, there was one more question. Um, what percentage down do you need to avoid CMHC insurance? And do we see that changing in the near future? Yeah, so, uh, you know, t t remember, you can only get an insured mortgage if you're buying a property for under a million, right? So that means if, if the purchase price is under a million, 20% down, and there's also like some sliding scale rules, so there might, it might actually be more like, it might be more than 20% down to avoid the CMHC, uh, you know, but is that going to change? But generally, yeah, speaking, generally it's 20. Okay. Yeah. And do, you, and do you hear rumblings that that might change and go to more or less or? Well, what they're actually uh, proposing is that um, the, on the other side, they're thinking of increasing the ceiling on the maximum purchase price for insured mortgages right. from 1 million to 1, 1, 1. 1.25 million, because if the average age, av average price of a house is 1 million, right. you know, yeah. so increasing that. Or above that, yeah. Yeah. Okay, okay. Yeah. Um, so just getting back to, I wanna make sure, did you, did you cover off what makes a pre-approval different than a pre qualification? Yeah, yeah, we talked about like sort of just the thoroughness of making sure we do a credit check and getting all sure. income documents up front. And the parents who are, are listening to this, I'm actually dealing with an uncle who's co-signing for his nephew. I said to the fellow, I said, Glenn, you're going to hate me for this process, because I'm going to have to ask you for all of the documents that I've asked your nephew for. Before pay stubs, you know, and he's kind of like an old school guy, 
You know, he's like, oh, you know, we used to just give it, I, I've got to give you my letter of employment. Right. Right. So he's got to go to his employer and ask for that letter of employment. So if you're co-signing or even acting as a guarantor, they're going to, we're going to ask you for everything. So don't be taken aback. Don't think it's just you. <laughs> It's everybody. It's right. not just us. The banks are going to ask for way more documentation than we ever will. So, <laughs> okay. um, so uh, speaking of like documentations or hurdles to jump over, I've heard that when a buyer has 20% down, that there are significantly more options for them. Is that true? Yeah. And, and, and what are some of the things buyers should be aware of with those additional options, if there are more? Right. Yeah, so the qualification guidelines are, are super strict, and especially if we're bringing in a co-signer who has some debts, the gross debt service ratio is 39, total debt service ratio is 44, right? And that's all based on the stress test rate of five and a quarter. So we're qualifying people, Chris, based on not an interest rate of 3%, but on five and a quarter, so and and now there's this uh, now there's always a ceiling on these debt ratios. So many financial institutions have realized that people have good credit, good income, but purchase prices are going up. So they will allow those debt ratio ceilings to be extended. It's an extended ratio program where the total debt and gross debt service ratio can be 50%. Sometimes with self-employed people, they'll take it to 60 or 70%. Wow. I'm doing a yeah, and and it's the rates are a little bit higher. There are typically one to one and a half percent fees on those mortgages, which we can capitalize or include into the mortgage, but it lifts the purchase price up when borrowers have twenty percent down or more. So this, uh, for example, you talked about a seventy percent. TDS or total debt service ratio, I think. Yeah, that is. I but have, I don't if, know. I don't know, Chris, this is pretty exciting. I don't know if you've ever done a mortgage where they have hypothecated funds. That was something that we just actually studied in the textbooks. I have done two mortgages just in the last 60 days. First time home buyers, where we brought the total debt service ratio up to 70%. And they allowed it because the financial institution took a hypothecation. So they took one month's uh, year, one year's worth of payments, and they put it into a GIC that was at that financial institution. So, uh, and and we were able to bring the total debt service ratio up to seventy percent. And you know what? And the, who cares? So I've got thirty thousand in a GIC for a three-year term, the GIC rates right now are fairly good, right? Yeah. So. Yeah. Um, so there was something else related to that that I wanted to ask about. Oh, so yeah, so the 70% the TDS, I'm just curious, like, is that really designed for like the self-employed person that sort of has the ability to write down a lot of their income? Mm -hmm. And 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 just for the person that's sent a note in, what does hypothecate mean? It just means you're you're putting the payments in the mortgage. Uh, you're putting money aside that guarantees the payment. That's kind of the the short of it, right, Sandra? Yeah, exactly. Great, great. Uh, you have a real great uh, way of boiling things down to a couple of sentences where I'm more long winded. Um, <laughs> uh, come on now, that's not true. Um, so is that, is that 70% TDS product? Is that one really for like, it's designed for self-employed people? Well, yeah, it's ex it's an excellent product, especially for self-employed people, because as you know, people are not staying at their own jobs for 30 years, like our parents did. Right. Mm -hmm. Where, you know, like, and especially in this area where we have a lot of people in the tech sector, they yeah. may, they may be working for multiple companies, pulling in a gross income of 150 or 200,000. But when you look at their T1 generals, they're making 50,000. So, or also parents who are co-signing, who own their own businesses, because we do deal a lot with that, like parents who are, who are co-signing, who own their own businesses or maybe self-employed consultants, 
because they've um, retired from their um, like fancy uh, executive jobs and now are doing consulting work. Um, that that's a really great option because those parents do not understand because they have never had trouble getting financing until they've had to co-sign for their kids, right? So I will, for the people who are watching us tonight, I wanted just for the, to let you know to be more flexible with that because we'll pull you through that and figure out the best option. Okay. And if your um, bank has declined, and if your bank has declined you, Chris. I, I I am almost 98% certain if you have good credit and at least 20 to 25% as a down payment, we can almost get anybody a mortgage. Okay. It's just being open to the options. Right. Um, so listen. Uh, one, of the things, one of the things I wanted to turn the table a little bit here, Chris. Me, me Sorry. Too. Me too. <laughs> I just wanted, I wanted to ask you, I wanted to ask you about list prices purchase prices and appraised values messed up that's the only thing <laughs> the only thing i have to say chris is is messed up and you own a financial services technology company that helps um that helps people uh facilitate appraisals so what i'm telling clients because most of the first time home buyers don't even have a chance to have a financing condition and in in nine in I'd say eighty five to ninety percent of the cases, we require the financial institution requires an appraisal on the property, right? So um, people are getting very nervous because let's just say you have a property that's listed for five hundred thousand, right? And the and they're like, oh my gosh, I have to bid seven hundred thousand on that property to get it. Right. So what we're finding is, and for those realtors that are on, on, on the webinar, I think you'll concur, is prices are list, uh, properties are listed artificially low. So it's very difficult for the buyers to understand what the ceiling is. So what we've done is we've got a really great system for first time home buyers where we work with the realtor. The realtor puts together a CMA, a comparative market analysis. We marry that with an auto valuation tool called Purview, and then that gives the clients some level of understanding on what the true value of the property is, because the listed price is not what the final purchase price would be, nor is it what the final appraised value is. And I wanted to get your comment, Chris. On, on on this area because you're like right in the weeds when it comes to appraisal. So I know you don't actually do the appraisals. Yeah. Tell us a little bit more about that. Uh, well, it's interesting. Um, appraisers are having a difficult time in some cases uh, because the market is moving fast, right? Um, we find there, it actually throws a lot of red flags off for a lender and the appraiser when the listing price is set too low, and um, and then there's this two or three hundred thousand over list uh, agreed to purchase price. Um, so what what the concern is that there's it was more of an auction setting and there was just too much emotion, and that uh, maybe the, the agreed upon prices is, is uh, too high. Now, you know, you're, you're in the mortgage business. So like I can tell you from, from our side that we probably see somewhere around 5% of all the appraisals that we're doing right now are coming in below the purchase price. Um, yes, and this is a very good point, Chris, because that actually uh, anecdotally again, that's what I'm seeing is the majority of appraisals that we we are doing for purchases and even for refinances are coming in close to value. But there's that like 5% that comes off like the 5% that's not, um, yeah. <laughs> you know. Yeah, yeah. and, and so, sometimes so on those 5%, the difference can be $200,000, not I'm not talking about 5% difference in the agreed upon price. I'm just saying as a 
total number of times it happens in yeah. a year or a, or a month, it's somewhere around four or 5% of the time. And sometimes the difference is so big um, that uh, I wonder how, you know, how do the people get these deals done? Are they putting down? Well, well, 100%? well, yeah, so this is, well, you know, it's funny you say that because I'm actually working on something that had the very same. So the uh, per, uh, purchase price was 800000 Borrowers were putting 400000 as a down payment. This isn't a first-time home buyer, right? Mm -hmm. But you still have to be careful. The appraised value on that property was six fifty, dollars right? Yeah. So, yeah. So, so as long as... Um, as long as the mortgage amount is 80% of whatever the appraised value would be or the purchase price, whatever is lower, the lender had no trouble getting financing, right? Where it might impact these people, like let's just say they're, they're, they're buying kind of their more forever home. Um, if they're going to be selling that house in a couple of years, they might be in a position where they're at a shortfall or not making any money on the, on the appreciation value. Right. 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 Yeah. Um, okay. So I think we've got a couple of cosigner or potential cosigners on the, <laughs> on the webinar. Um, yeah. You probably, you probably get like a, a regular set of questions from cosigners. What, what are some of the things yeah. that cosigners ask and, and what are the answers to those questions? Yeah, I would say pro if I would say like maybe if I were to say if like four years ago we hardly dealt with any cosigners, I'd say probably seventy five percent of the first time home buyers that we're working with have some parental help, whether they're cosigners or giving a gift. So one of the um, typical questions I have about a gifted down payment is it considered income for the recipients? Right. And and so there and, and of course, it's a gift. So there is no taxes, income taxes charged on that. And how we sort of um, verify that it's a gift is uh, we, we get a, a particular gift letter and then the fight and the money needs to be in, in the account. And I mean, I don't want to get into the minutia. However, so, so Sandra, if, I, if the parents are co-signing, though, hmm. and they see money as a gift, the lenders don't see it as a gift because the co-signers are registered on the title of the property right, so as, co down as down payment. So then we have to switch gears and, and look at how to, we need three months worth of bank statements. You're absolutely right. So that's one um, question I get. The other one I get is, well, what's the difference between a co-signer and a guarantor, right? Very rarely do I see first time home buyers have the um, sort of financial strength to have their parents on as guarantors. So guarantor guarantees the mortgage loan but isn't registered on the title of the property. And typically a situation like a guarantor would be is if it's, um, uh, let's just say, uh, partners, and one of the partners works in a field that's highly litigious, like a lawyer or an engineer or some type of self-employed person. You know, you've got two partners or spouses. The one spouse is acting as a guarantor for the loan because we need their income. We need her income to qualify the mortgage, but she's actually not registered on the title because of the type of work she does. Co-signers are more typical with first-time home buyers, and how we handle that is actually we work in partnership with the lawyer and the lender, and the property is owned in tenancy in common, where the house is divided into 100 shares, the parents own one or 2% of the shares of the property, and they're registered on the title of the property. Gotcha. So, yeah. And, and the reason why we do that, so the other question I have, Chris, is capital gains. Because right. if, they're, if they're registered as joint tenants on a secondary property, just like many of our, our listeners today would be, um, they, if they're registered as joint tenants, like you, like you and your, you and me, we're married, we're spouses, we're joint tenants on, on our house. But if you're joint tenants with your child, and then you got to be removed off the title of the property where you each own the property uh, equally, 
there could be a capital gains issue. So that's why we do the tenancy in common where they're only registered for one or 2% ownership. Gotcha. Um, question about, um, I, I think it's important for someone that's co-signing to, to keep in mind is that down the road, they may want to buy a house or a car or something else. How, how does having a, a, a mortgage that you've co-signed affect you? Yeah. Yes. Well, you, cause you have to bring in those liabilities. You're that, that mortgage actually appears on your credit history. And so you have to be mindful of that. If, if you're thinking about buying another property or a car or something like that, you may have to put that on pause while you're co-signing. And I find usually people, typically it's a five-year kind of run, but I've had many co-signers who have had their parents removed after two years on the, on as co-signers because right. they've gotten better, like got a better credit history, their properties have appreciated value. Yeah. So income. I would say probably income, yeah, minimum of two years it might end up being five. So you might okay. have that cottage purchase put on hold <laughs> or right. that, that, uh, I don't know. What are you, what kind of car are you looking new, at, Chris? New car, new car, a Corvette. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Listen, everybody's been very patient. Uh, and you know, we've been here for th about 30 minutes. I'd love to, right. to thank everybody for uh, participating awesome. today and uh, your comments and your questions in the chat and the Q&A. Sandra, is there any last things you wanted to leave us with before uh, we close out the webinar? Yeah, thank you so much. Um, we're here to help. And I mean, we, my team, I'm just so excited about the work that we're doing because we're doing excellent work. And you can see it from the feedback that we're getting uh, from our clients online and just what we're hearing our clients say. So if you have any questions, just go to my website, skipthebank.ca, and you can actually schedule a 30-minute telephone or online appointment from there. And I'd love to chat with you if you have some questions about co-signing for your children or your first-time home buyer and you have got want to kind of navigate that. Um, and you can also uh, just contact me uh, through that. We will be following up. Thanks for putting that in the uh, chat again, Chris. We will be following up with information probably within the next, i just getting back from vacation. And next week I'm on a, on a little bit of a family vacation. So I'll make sure we get that informa this information out to you just as soon as possible. Okay. Well, uh, with that, I'd love to thanks everybody again. So thank you, Sandra, thank you for uh, being the, our, you know, being on the firing line for us and I uh, look forward to doing this again with you sometime soon. Awesome. Thanks. Have a good night, Chris. You too. Bye.